been um, a real uh, pleasure making this show here, working with a brilliant team here at the CTA, led by Sergio. Um, and I'd uh, like to thank Yoa and Leah and Maya, who are basically like, helping make a good part of the show. Um, but uh, uh, most of all, uh, brilliant Ken Mir, uh, who curated the show.
real as well, we've come to understand contemporary art, not so much as the non-specific, non-genre that is usually presented as, but rather as a limited art historical tradition. So I'd like to extrapolate here some of the ideas that I've come, that I've kind of come to through doing the ongoing work of what I've had to do for. Some of these ideas are highly speculative, some perhaps highly contestable. And we'll have plenty of time to argue about all of this in the discussion that will follow. Um, and then I will welcome your contributions and challenges. But I'd like to start with a brief and subjective history of contemporary art. And for me, this really begins with Immanuel Kant. I'll quote him here from the Critique of Pure Reason. The Kant said, up to now, it has been assumed that all our cognition must conform to the objects. But all attempts to find out something about them, a priori, through concepts that will extend our cognition, have, on this presupposition, on this presupposition comes down. Hence, let us, hence let us once try whether we do not get further with the problems of metaphysics by assuming that the objects must conform to our cognition. With his critique of pure reason in 1781, Immanuel Kant concluded that objective knowledge can't be possible outside human experience. In the words of the physicist and new realist philosopher Gabriel Kaplan, writing recently, Kant's assertion of human autonomy serves only to preserve the pre-modern landscape and stitch up the cosmological narcissistic wound. I think that's a pretty good diss. And that narcissistic wound that uh, Kant refers to is the wound of man decentered, or mankind decentered through enlightenment science's Copernican revolution. To put it simply, if science decentered mankind the universe, then Kant compensates for this by deciding that reality could only be correlated to and accessed from human experience. This is what the philosopher Graham Harmon calls the philosophy of access. Or what Quentin may assume and calls correlation. And this 200 year trajectory of continental philosophy from Kant's original compensated humanist injunction upon thought could be seen as the original sin that I think laid out the path to contemporary art and the world that it, it, it inhabited. But to really understand the romanticism upon which contemporary art was founded, we must turn first to its immaculate conception in Marcel Duchamp's original creative act. Quote here Duchamp from 1957. The creative act is not performed by the artist alone. The spectator brings the work in contact with the external world by deciphering and interpreting its inner qualification and thus adds his contribution to the creative act. Duchamp shifted the precise location of art from production to interpretation. And with this, he announced into art the Kantian fantasy that reality is produced by human experience. And Duchamp's formulation of the creative act meant that, in Kantian terms, we can access the artwork only through our subjective relation to it. That art, quoting Duchamp from 1961, must be refined as pure sugar from molasses by the spectator. The reality of art was thereby limited to the viewer's experience, with art's consequences possible only through interpretation. Duchamp articulated this formulation of the creative act 40 years after the original controversy of his founding. And it is at this time that his ideas were widely adopted through pop art free persons. There are several published accounts which I won't enumerate here of Duchamp's influence on Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, and John Hedge, who reinvigorated interest in him. With Warhol's own ready mates, Duchamp's art coefficient was adopted as the basic logic of what would then become <coughs> the art. 
Christian was perceived as the elitist specialist language of abstraction. Art now faced with the vernacular language of mass media. The Uranian Clem Greenberg's aspirations to, to determine art's terms of production, this new configuration of art prioritised the viewer's interpretation and thereby instilled in art for half a century Kant's philosophy of access. So no reality of art was acknowledged outside our access to it. The interpretive pluralism brought about by this paradigm shift in art prefigured the ideal conditions for contemporary art that were yet to come. Although the term contemporary has been used throughout the second half of the last century to describe the art being made at the time, I would suggest that our use <coughs> now refers more specifically to the particular ideological formation of art that emerged from the deregulation of financial services by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s and the collapse of communism as a viable political alternative at the end of that decade. This was the world that contemporary art had been waiting for. The global ideology of non-ideology produced a contemporary art boom with, in Britain for example, the first generation of wealthy young hedge fund managers providing the initial market for YBA, or Young British Artists, in the 90s. And later followed by Russian oligarchs, Middle Eastern wealth in the noughties, and then the emerging markets of China, and then India, and Brazil through the global financial crisis. Despite their mostly nominal oppositional politics, this generation of artists were the, this generation of artists were the, the a children of Thatcher and wasted no time in forging an immediate relationship with their audience and their market. Taking control of their early trajectories with a proliferation of artist run spaces, they worked in the vernacular language of mass media <coughs> and played out their careers in the mainstream press. Absorbing the model of the hedge fund manager who operates outside the City of London or the financial districts of aristocratic rules and institutionalized competencies. These artist run spaces soon became part of the institutionalized ecology of the art system. Whilst the wealth produced by deregulated free markets created the perfect context for contemporary art, cultural and economic feedback started to flow in the other direction too. And the model of the now superstar artist was adopted throughout the new cultural industries and then the wider economy as a model for insecure labour. Meanwhile, the Sorota led revolution successfully repositioned contemporary art as a popular entertainment experience, with the example of Tate Modern adopted around the world to reimagine arts institutions as retail propositions, in line with an emancipatory social program to engage broad audiences in culture, essentially as a leisure market. But art was also instrumentalised more directly. Firstly, onto the front line of urban rebranding, with public art regenerating town centres all over the world. Secondly, onto the corporate social responsibility programmes of most major corporations. And thirdly, through the education or community requirements of art institutions, co opting social practice as social work. The crucial point here is that art has always produced its reality structurally and not just through its viewers' interpretation. The most ambitious art entrepreneur in the noughties understood this and used their position as artists or as critics to organise the system of art on an industrial scale. For example, Anton Bedoval and friends with Eflux, or Matthew Slotover and Amanda Sharp with the Freeze Art Fair. By 2006, art had become, albeit on a financially small scale, probably the most sophisticated system of value creation in the history of the world. And the turbocharged art system that emerged during the preceding financial boom required artists to provide, at its peak, $60 billion a year, according to Artnet, worth of window dressing for art's three main economic functions. One, the acquiring of status, two, the cleansing of conscience, and three, the sheltering of tax. 
And just like the one that the artist had prefigured the idea of the cultural worker, the artist was now left as the ghost of state investment in public services. Digging wells and planting trees. So it may once have seemed as though contemporary art would continue its biennialising expansion forever, as sure of the neoliberal certainty that the era of big government was over. Contemporary art was seen at the time as a universal, non-specific, non-genre, just as its neoliberal world was naturalised as the product of supposedly non-ideological, pragmatic economic strategies. But as the consequence of 2007's US subprime mortgage crisis have unfolded into a global recession, the world's strongest new super economies are growing through massive state intervention as the economic rationale for the neoliberal project collapses, with the failure of its austerity program to produce growth, leaving only a diminished, quasi-religious belief in markets in its place. I suggest that it has now become urgent to look outside the envelope of that first consumption bubble and see that perhaps contemporary art and neoliberalism both perpetuate a very particular, and I'd say pretty much identical, type of subjectivity both interpolating the viewer, consumer, system as a liberated, <coughs> autonomous individual. It's this freedom of spectatorship, this interpretational agency that contemporary art's favourite philosophers like Jacques Rancière defend. And it's exactly this Kantian subjectivity that we artists have become experts in by addressing our viewers through work that is for interpretation, with space for the viewer to be free to experience art on their own individual terms. Whereas the so-called modern art of the industrial age was justified in relation to its own abstract language, the so-called contemporary art that accompanied the age of neoliberal financialization was justified only by our interpretation of it. What we call contemporary art came about in the era of broadcast media, when TV, for example, was for us, cinema was for us, it was for spectatorship. Contemporary art was kind of the ultimate um, of this type of form, in that it required the viewer, it actually required the viewer to complete the art. But these received ideas about spectatorship in the gallery maybe are not necessarily appropriate for the big media and about it. Because media is not like that anymore. Today's media is more kind of algorithmic. If we think about our most ubiquitous social networking platforms, because these most ubiquitous ones are the ones that are already really shaping how we relate to each other, then Google and Facebook. They take us not simply as their spectators, but also as their very materials. For all sorts of all sorts of purposes, processed through algorithms that we see very little of. We can understand networks as sites of intersection between human and non-human materiality. And if we can think beyond contemporary art's Kantian paradigm, that I would suggest it based on a scientifically <coughs> distinction between subjects and objects, or between viewer and art. Then, maybe we can understand art as being ecologically contingent. By that I mean contingent within the continuum of both the organic and the inorganic materiality of its networks, within the human and non-human materiality of its networks. Doing the work of the past to come forth, I've come to understand spectatorship as part of the materials of the world, rather than its sole purpose. Its materials include all its transactions, its conspiracies, its manipulations, as well as the physical objects in the gallery, and its myriad interdependencies and consequences. But rather than being specific to the work of one past to come forth, it's maybe worth thinking in these kind of ecological terms about our whole biennialising art system, which is now entirely globally networked. 
Most of the shows we know about are in our inbox. Most of the art that we see is on the internet. So art now exists in its circulation. And its conventional institutions, such as the gallery, are reconfigured perhaps within these broader ecologies of our network reality. Potentially reconstituting the very purpose of art beyond spectatorship. So what if we understand the art system itself as an answer? What if we took responsibility for the means by which art circulates as part of the world of art? Then doing art would become an issue of negotiating agency by instituting its systems of distribution. And herein could lie a way past what I have come to see personally as the kind of dead end of contemporary art logic of critique. Derived from conceptual art, which was after all almost instantly institutionalized and academicized, criticality, which is a word that doesn't even make grammatical sense, but is now taught and learned and rehearsed and played out to create value. And it's exactly this type of value that's crucial, in fact, at the top end of the art market. Institutions, of course, require critique to maintain their their authority. And so contemporary art is required to play its pretend politics within its institutional pockets of modern opposition. So rather than playing up to the romantic heroic fantasy of pretending to avoid institutionalization or critiquing institutions, I'm more interested in asking how to institute. I'm particularly interested in this question in the somewhat accelerated context of Sri Lanka. In the south of the island, contemporary art has, over the last three years only, through its post-war economic liberalisation, established itself, like everywhere else, as the highest benchmark of connoisseurial consumerism. In the formerly Tamil-occupied territories, territories of the north, however, through three decades of civil war, there is no art system. So led by my collaborators in the north of Sri Lanka, the next phase of the ongoing work of what last year can come forward will set in motion in the coming months an online and offline media platform based on Augusto Boal's Forum Theatre <coughs> Forum Theatre methodology. Developed by Boal in Brazil in the 1970s, this is a method of collective improvisation whereby communities devise scenes based on social difficulties that are then replayed again and again with the audience, or, or what Boal calls the spect actors, exchanging roles with the originated participants to provide alternative solutions. This methodology has, particularly in South America, produced extraordinary structural change, with a derivative known as legislative theatre, even responsible for changing worlds in Brazil. The trouble with this type of methodology in the world of Sri Lanka, though, is that it happens live in a room. Whereas oppositional solidarity in the North dispersed throughout the diaspora when Tamils fled the brutal end of the Civil War there in 2001. So, what is being developed through the ongoing work of Wednesday to become formed is a globally networked platform for this type of process to happen through geographically dispersed collaboration. Scenes will be devised through workshops, recorded on video, and then uploaded to be responded to with video scenes reworked and replayed not only through workshops alongside subsequent institutional exhibitions of the ongoing gallery site of work of when Plastic can come for, but also independently from anywhere in the world. This will be an open source media form that can virally proliferate wherever it's useful. And now that everyone's a filmmaker, I'm interested in the potential of this as a media form that can do kind of a, the opposite of cinema not addressing a universal viewer, but rather specifically organising action along the lines by which power is structured. And therein might lie in opposition to one of the underlying principles of contemporary art. It's aesthetic equalisation based on the liberal logic of universal rights. I mentioned Jack once here before, another one of contemporary art's favourite things is Boris Grice. Uh, gives a good account in, in 
but <coughs> one power of universal right as it pertains to contemporary art, recognizing how, and I quote, it's not to the vertical infinity of divine truth that artists today make reference, but to the horizontal infinity of aesthetically equal images. In fact, it's probably worth quoting Kreuzer below here. Okay, so some images that artists insert into the context of the international art scene signal their particular ethnic or cultural origin. At the same time, other artists transplant mass media for these images into the context of their own regional cultures as a means of escaping the provincial and folkloric dimensions of their immediate viewers. But in both instances, the images in question are simply examples that point to the infinite, utopian realm of aesthetic equality, endowed with equal aesthetic rights. And basically, Grice here is describing how contemporary art gives equal permission for remixing across cultures, across history, and across genres. However, the trouble with contemporary art's assertion of universal aesthetic rights, as Christ did, um, is the same, at least structurally, I think, as the trouble with the United Nations' assertion of universal human rights. This liberal conception of universal rights permits the bombing of non-liberal nations to hand down human rights, but it prevents the addressing of structural oppression because it invokes an abstract concept, that of equality. This abstract concept is institutionally normalized without being able to be without being able to address the means by which that normalization occurs. This is in fact how the international community failed to prevent the 2009 genocide in Sri Lanka, much like it failed the land before. If any of you are um, particularly interested in this connection between art and human rights, I should, um, then uh, uh, this has been very thoroughly researched by Suhail Malik um, at Goldsmiths and at Bard. So, in response to the consequence of the catastrophic ethical failure of universal rights in Sri Lanka, when platitudes come forward, rather than asserting equal rights, deals with and in the ecology of structural exploitation. To set in motion perhaps a kind of conspiracy of consequences against human rights. But contemporary art may prove inappropriate for the next phase of globalization. The massive history is still to be written between the world's multiple new non Western, non liberal economic powers. If so, it will be up to us to figure out what a new art could be for. Beyond the contemporary. Thank you. The first stab. Um, when I invited you to do this show here, Christopher, part of the appeal for me was the were the parallels between Sri Lanka and Israel Palestine. Do you see those here, and how are they the same? How are they different, both in terms of art and generally? Yeah, um, I, I'm, I don't know if I'm qualified to comment on the similarities, but uh, I'm, I, I'm certainly interested in the entanglement. Um, and uh, I think the similarities are actually part of the reason for the entanglement. Um, the uh, civil war in Sri Lanka that... Um, uh, started in the 70s and ended in 2009, ended with a international coalition that Sri Lanka's president, Rajapaksa, um, formed against the Tamil Tigers. Um, the Tamil Tigers uh, were operating in, at times, brutal ways, um, but that brutality was um, uh, surpassed many times over by the uh, uh, particularly violent end of the civil war, um, which was done with international support from uh, China, India, the United States, uh, and the Israeli government who provided helicopter gunships uh, to um, President Rajapaksa's uh, armed forces. Um, and I think the motivation of the Israeli government, I, I don't know, but I, I think... 
um, there could certainly be ide ideological reasons for wanting to defeat uh, the insurgency. But did the, did the Israelis also support the Tamils at some point? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Sorry, can you guys hear us? No, never mind. So, um, the... Uh, the um, Israeli government has also uh, support uh, has also trained the Tamil Tigers over um, a couple of decades, but now provides um, intelligence uh, advice and support um, to the Sri Lankan government on issues of uh, of the separation of the north um, and uh, and security. I guess therein lies the similarity. <laughs> I, when I was presenting your work a little bit to some students here, um, we had just finished or a week before some discussion about institutional critique, and I realized that your work actually falls in a really sophisticated line as a kind of sophisticated evolution of maybe that kind of work, except that you're not critiquing institutions necessarily, you're critiquing the institution of art in general. Do you think that's too simple? Do you think that's totally missing the mark? Do you care? No, no, no. Of course I care. Um, and I'm... I'm interested in that historical trajectory of art from institutional critique, but um, I'm not sure if it's critique that this work is engaged in, in that, um, in that the, the critical distance I don't think is there in this work. I think this work is entirely complicit and entangled in um, uh, the ecologies of uh, of art and its institutions and its markets, um, and particularly in in Sri Lanka, that's in in relation to how the art market has kind of appeared um, through the country's economic liberalisation in the wake of. Um, what could be called a genocide. But rather than critiquing, I'm more interested in instituting art's reality and um, uh, I think art has always produced its reality. Um, it's produced its reality in all sorts of ways, structurally, financially, societally, hierarchically as well as spiritually or affectively or anything. And yet we've tended to kind of ignore all of the ways in which art is made by reality and makes reality um, to prioritise talking about what art does only for <coughs> the viewer's interpretation. Um, and I think um, critique is part of that uh, part of that logic that sees art's purpose as um, for the viewer. I'm kind of more interested in instituting rather than critiquing institutions. But I, yeah, I understand how that is an evolution of that history of institutional critique. But isn't, I mean, when you're saying in, you're, you're interested in institutionalizing, basically, are you, is there a cynicism there? I mean, is there, do you really want to do that? It, is some of your work ironic? Um, I, I don't. Um, I think cynicism is really confusing because its meaning has changed so much from like the you know Greek cynic philosophers to how we popularly use that word. And I think it's changed so much that I actually don't know precisely what that word means anymore. Um, but I do understand this work as atheistic, um, and uh, you know I think this work is sort of. Like, it comes from a mistrust of 
any organized religion. Uh, and so... You're talking about the religion of contemporary art? Yeah. Um, so in, in, if you're referring to that sort of that understanding of cynicism as in mistrust of belief systems then sure I can understand that as cynical but, um, but I think more it's atheistic and, um, and what I don't buy what I don't relate to with how a lot of people use the word cynicism is a sort of pessimism or hopelessness I'm actually very excited about the possibilities of art, um, and this is an attempt to to set something in motion that might perhaps <coughs> extend beyond the parameters with which within which art is instituted now. Can you talk a little bit about um, authorship in your work, appropriation, and just the the practicalities of um, doing this to somebody else's artwork? Like, how does that happen? Do you, do you ever meet the artists? Do you want to meet the artists? Do they know what you're doing? What's going to happen if they find out? Um, well, I'm, I, I don't know any of the artists, and I don't want to, um, to have a personal relationship with any of the artists. Um, I've been pretty, uh, pretty precise about that in doing this work. I'm dealing only with their commercial galleries, so I don't know how they feel about it. I haven't kept anything from uh, their commercial galleries, though. I just think that they're not interested. It's so. F I mean, what I'm doing is so far out of their context, and it's. I mean, it's it's part of the sale agreement of of the work that I can exhibit it however I want, um, and I really don't think they care. But do they know? The gallerists know what you do with the work? I mean, they should do. Any questions from the audience? Yes? Um, I'd like to know how intellectual property laws would deal with the fact that you're creating something and recreating something. Yeah, this is a really interesting <coughs> uh, uh, technical question because intellectual property law um, uh, doesn't really cover the work in the gallery but it does cover the proliferation of the documentation of the paintings more than the sculptures that I've reconfigured um, I mean this is getting pretty technical but that's because a photograph of a painting isn't considered uh, legally to be the same I'm, I'm sorry, a photograph of a sculpture isn't considered legally to be the same as a sculpture, but a photograph of a painting is a reproduction of that image. Um, so, uh, yeah, so what's happening in the gallery isn't an IP issue. Um, uh, it could potentially be a moral rights issue, but that's very unlikely, uh, almost impossible. Could you be sued by any of the artists in Sri Lanka? Uh, not on the basis of intellectual property. Um, and I think it would be very, 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 very difficult to make a case on the basis of the artist's moral rights. Interestingly, this, um, I mean, an, an, an attempt was made along those lines to sue Harold Slayman when he curated the exhibition When Attitudes Become Form um, in, at the end of the 60s, or was it 1970? Um, 67. 67, okay. Uh, so, um, I mean, Slayman's often cited as the first sort of independent curator, and at that time, um, uh, the idea of curatorial authorship that we now perhaps take for granted was certainly not wildly, uh, widely held. So, um, so some of the artists in the exhibition. Uh, didn't like the way that their work was framed and um, I mean that that case didn't get anywhere but it's, it's interesting that uh, there was an attempt to sue uh, Slayman um, in this case uh, no I mean first of all I'm pretty certain that uh, the galleries um, wouldn't be interested in suing me I've become a good client of theirs and they're not really interested in what I'm doing with this. Um, 
I've avoided personal relationships with the artists, not for reasons of concealment. Like, there's nothing concealed here. Um, uh, I've avoided that for, you know, other artistic reasons. But, um, yeah, I think it would be really tenuous to bring a moral rights case here. Uh, I think you, you have a, a follow-up question. Sorry. Maybe also part of the answer to that is that, you know, within the kind of economic legal system, it would mm. be a lot harder for them to sue you, considering, you know, your position economically and demographically. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's the I guess that's the important point. I mean, to even figure out the territory in which to make a case would cost so much that it really wouldn't be it really wouldn't be worth it. I mean. And, so isn't this kind of mean of you? Like, isn't that kind of like a really violent thing to do? Well, I can only think about it in terms of like how I feel about my work. It, when I sell it, I, I can't, you know, when I've made the decision to sell my work, I wouldn't expect to tell you what to do with it. And I may not like the sofa you hang it above, but that isn't my business anymore. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm purchasing these artists work on their terms. Um, so, no, that's not part of the work that keeps me up at night. There are other things that I worry about with this work, what do you worry about? but uh, but not that. Like what? Well, everything else. <laughs> yes, Maya. So, where this conversation is going makes me not understand why the core made a point to talk about the equality of aesthetics. You know, it seems like there's a real imbalance. That was exactly my point. I was um, I was talking against Boris Grice's conception of equal aesthetic rights. So, I mean, people like Grice who defend contemporary art in those terms see the emancipatory power of contemporary art as lying in uh, the equal permission with which um, anything that can be remixed across media across history, across culture. Um, but I think the problem with that is the same as the United Nations, the problem with the United Nations conceptual, conception of human rights, um, in that uh, because it's based on an abstract conception of equality, it isn't um, a very useful way of understanding the uh, structuring of, of power specifically. And, and actually, it is that logic of of universal rights that gave cover for the international community to not avoid to prevent genocide in Sri Lanka in 2009. Sergio. Yeah, I'm coming and going so different subjects of your your feed that you have, so I'm going to a completely different uh, question. Uh, you were quite um, critical of the, the modern history of British art and, and uh, uh, equated YBA art with the Thatcheristic art and uh, mentioned like the Sirota doctrine and high art in entertainment. Uh, is this kind of critique uh, uh, normal or widespread in, in, in the UK at this moment or is, is it your, uh, your own personal theory? I mean, I agree with you completely. I'm very happy that you uh, that you expressed that. But I wonder if there's something because this content uh, situation in the art world in, in the UK is quite uh, astonishing a lot of this year. Uh, that wasn't a critique. No. I was talking about that stuff to to kind of like unpick um, the uh, the actual ecologies of art and how art is produced by its contiguous reality and, and, and also produces its reality. Um, but, uh, you know, I was just trying to, to, uh, to analyse what happened to art in Britain since the 90s, um, not so much a, as a critique. I mean, I love that stuff. Uh, but, <laughs> but I think it's really interesting, you know, what happened in Britain then, because um, 
because Britain didn't have this sort of long-standing history of middle-class collecting, like middle-class art collecting, contemporary art collecting, that you find in continental Europe, right? Like in Germany or France, um, it is not unusual for um, like professionals, for doctors, for lawyers to collect contemporary art. That totally didn't exist in Britain. Um, there was no domestic market for art until um, that generation of artists m made an immediate relationship like made an immediate kind of popular engagement with art and that popular interest in art that sort of produced that uh, Tate Modern, that in turn now has created a market. Like the popular engagement with art preceded the market for art, which is like kind of the other way around than in other places, but in, in Europe, certainly. Yeah, but, but economically it was fueled by the, by the natural economy Dividing and having the upper middle class being really wealthy and able to, to buy, and the lower one disappearing into the, to the proletariat and the proletarian crash. So, uh, so at this stage, you know, just a few weeks ago, we had this. Uh, I mean, for me, I, I was not, not aware of the still the antagonism that the, the figure, specifically uh, economically, that the figure of Thatcher has still until this day, until the, the scenes we saw. When she died a few weeks ago, then I wonder um, if, if you talk to YDAs, to these artists, and you say, well, you know, your success is in a way due to to this uh, to, to the economical policy of, of the Thatcher. Yeah, I think that's what do you think about what, what these artists think about it, including Daniel Harris, you know, like all of them. I you say, yeah, sure, great. <laughs> I can't speak for them, but um, uh, certainly the e economic conditions for that particular um, uh, context of art were, I think, the product of the deregulation of financial services at that time. Um, and I think, and, and also that first generation of hedge fund managers were the initial market for that work. Um, but also that kind of hedge fund manager model is the sort of model that was adopted by some of those artists. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that connection is a, is a really entangled one. But, um, but you know, I kind of, I like a lot of that work too. Although, I mean, you ask about whether, whether this understanding of, of YBA is widespread in Britain now. Um, I don't think anyone thinks about YBA in Britain now. I mean, artists of my generation don't un very rarely understand what they're doing as a legacy of, of, of YBA. I mean, the broadsheets used to talk about YBA right up until the like, last decade, but even the broadsheets have stopped now. Can I ask? I just want to add a few thoughts on this. Um, somebody might have heard me say this already, but the... The art market and the international arms trade are the two largest unregulated markets in the world. They're the only markets without an index. So whereas most other fields have index and price ranges and they're regulated, the value of artwork is um, just agreed upon by us. We like together decide how much like a pickled shark is worth or uh, whatever is worth. And, um, and it, th I think the relationship between these two, um, these two markets is actually really interesting because neoliberalism, it, the, there recently were really interesting studies showing that the art market doesn't necessarily um, succeed, or it, it succeeds not so much when the general economy is doing well, it's art succeeds when the gap between rich and poor widens. So when there are periods where the gap between rich and poor uh, get bigger, that's when the art market actually succeeds. And so we're really complicit in the, in the neoliberalism, basically, or in these policies. And I think that's, what's, um, that's what makes this kind of work so important, I think, is for us to realize our place within the system and our agency. And that's why I feel guilty when I look at your work because I like it so much and I'm like, oh, I shouldn't like it so much. <laughs> Tal, did you have a question? Um, can you talk a little bit about the art, secret art center that is going to be open to like a, 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 a 
the question would be open. Uh, can I talk more about the secret art centre that's going to be opened in the north of Sri Lanka? No, because there is no secret art centre in the north of Sri Lanka. <laughs> but to pick up, just before we get into that or avoid that, the, uh, to pick up on, on uh, what Han was just talking about, um, I think it's uh, amazing that diamonds are no longer used for money laundering because they're not worth enough. Money laundering now generally always happens through art. Um, yeah, there's no secret art centre. But you were just, I mean, the, the, the form film, the form theatre stuff is what she's asking about. Uh, yeah, so the um, next evolution of this work uh, is um, uh, a, a media platform that I'm developing with others um, to uh, provide a, a tool, a kind of open source tool that can virally proliferate if it's useful. And it's a tool by which um, the kind of methodology that I described um, uh, when talking about forum theatre, uh, based on Augusto Boal's methodology, when th uh, that kind of process can happen in a geographically dispersed way. That's a platform for collaborative filmmaking. Um, yeah. There is no secret art centre. <laughs> how would you implement that in Sri Lanka, in the north of Sri Lanka? Like how would it work with the communities? Do they have internet? Do they? Do they have like community groups? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, yes, there is quite a lot of internet uh, in Sri Lanka and in the north. Um, I am working with community groups in the north of Sri Lanka and have been over the course of the last, well, for quite a while. Um, and um, so we'll soon uh, test out some workshops there and also in uh, uh, communities outside Sri Lanka um, uh, where uh, Tamil refugees have fled to. Um, particularly in London, particularly in Toronto, for example. Uh, uh, so the workshops um, will happen in Sri Lanka and also alongside the uh, al alongside institutional exhibitions of this work. Um, and but also contributions can be made independently um, from anywhere in the world. Um, I have another, if someone always has to ask the gender question, <laughs> can you, um, like, all the work down there is of naked ladies, no? Can you talk about the net gender dynamics in your show a little bit, and spectatorship? Uh, the artists who, um, who have become successful in the new contemporary art boom in Sri Lanka seem to have a thing for naked ladies. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's, it's interesting how sort of high modernism um, from the West is taken up now as contemporary art in Sri Lanka. Because what contemporary means in this context is from the Western art historical, yeah. like canon, as opposed to traditional Sri Lankan art. Like a cubism in the museum, this color, it's gonna look like that. But 
the environment and uh, the contrast between the, um, like uh, the work that they're using, we're using like as props or commodity for or just material for uh, to pick it up. It's it's sort of like um, like it's obvious. Um, like a bronze uh, sculpture, right? And uh, oil on the canvas, and uh, we have, and we use like uh, really like uh, contemporary high tech uh, stuff, like uh, complicated <coughs> um, uh, glossy colors. It's something really accurate about that, and but it, it works so well. And, um, Thanks. No, like, is it what you're thinking about is to like, create this contrast, uh, contrast between the, 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 the classic materials yeah. and uh, like, the cliche of the materials of this kind of sculpture, <coughs> contemporary arts, like the look of, or the. I'm just wondering, it's not really a. No, no, I think that's a really, I think that's a, a really important question. Um, I mean, I'm pretty um, precise about um, the work <coughs> that I purchase to reconfigure. Um, it's not just anything being made now in Sri Lanka. It, I, I buy the work of the artists that are becoming very successful in this very specific new context. Uh, in this new gallery system that didn't exist before in Sri Lanka. Um, and I'm just as specific about uh, the context that I translate it into. And, um, and that is not just any art being made now. It's um, uh, the, what I kind of understand as um, a moment of, of, of spectacular kind of vacuity um, at the top end of the art market now where entire gallery programs are are based um, entirely on a sort of mannered formalism right um, so yeah I mean you could see that as a sort of I suppose satire on the recurring tropes and the recurring tropes of my contemporaries Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.